Is it on? Okay. <laughs> Bear with me. I'm not the best public speaker in the world, and I'm a little nervous. So, that said. <laughs> um, so, we are putting together this presentation for you just as a way to kind of streamline information. Now, this information hasn't come all from me. It's come from a bunch of different people, faces in the crowd that are here tonight and everything. And it's just to kind of give you the other side of the story that you might not have heard on Thursday if you were here. Um, mm -hmm. Pelham Pipeline Awareness Facebook page. We have that going. Anyone can ask to join. You'll be signed in as a private page so that not everyone can see what's on there. And a lot of information can come from NewHampshirePipelineAwareness.org. And that's where a lot of my information has come from, too. So, next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Kayla. I grew up in Carlisle until I was 10. And then when I was 11, I moved here to Pelham. So I've been in town for a really long time. I left to go to college in Boston and then moved back to Pelham because I think it's a great area to start my family. I have a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. And... I grew up on Little Island Pond, and right now I live on what used to be called Old Lawrence Road, and now it's called Briarwood Road. They changed the names of the towns recently, the streets recently. I'm going to talk for only three slides about the source of natural gas, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit of why it's not a benefit to New Hampshire, this pipeline project, and then I'm going to talk about why it's not a benefit to Pelham. And then I'm going to open it up for open forum. I'm not going to, the goal of that I am bringing here tonight is that I don't want to just throw a lot of information at you. I want everyone to kind of work together to get information out too, so. Okay, next slide. <laughs> I'm gonna start right off with the maps of where this is coming through town so you can kind of get a better feel for it. Um, so it starts up on the Wyndham line and it comes down past Talent Road. And I'm actually going to, I have a list of the roads. Donna Butler was very good in putting together a list of the roads in Pelham that it goes through. So I'm just gonna read those. Um, and these are impacted roads, not necessarily the direct pipeline, but impacted by that blast radius that you may have heard about. So Andrea Lane, Birch Lane, Brandy Lane, Briarwood Road, formerly Old Lawrence Road, Bridge Street near Rita Ave, Carriage Circle, Clark Circle, East End near Dutton Road, Claudine Drive, Clydesdale Avenue near Birch Lane, Deer Hill Circle, Dick Tracy Drive, which I cannot believe that's an actual name of a town, a road in town, Dogwood Circle, Dutton Road between Clark Circle and West Shore Drive, Fairview Drive, Fletcher Lane near Briarwood, Frontier Drive, Garland Drive near Deer, Deer Hill, Gaudet Lane, Glenside Drive near Talent Road, Hayden Road, Heatherly Lane, Hillcrest Lane, Hutchinson Bridge Road, Industrial Park Drive, Katie Lane, Lemire Drive, Linda Avenue, Main Street between Gage Hill Road, Pine Valley Golf Links, Mammoth Road between Industrial Ave and the Town of Wyndham, Newcomb Field Parkway, Rita Avenue, Shelley Drive, Simpson Road, Talent Road between Fairview Drive and Shelley Drive, Tina Ave, West Shore Drive near Dutton Road, Wyndham Road between Simpson and Lemire and Winterberry Road. So that's quite a lot of roads here in town. Um, it crosses Beaver Brook a couple of times. We know that it gets really close to some homes. That's the slide that my house is on up there. I'm going to take a sip of water while they're going through all these. That, that slide, that last slide that was just on, that shows Little Island Pond up in the corner. And there's a shared watershed where this is going through that could end up down. Little Island Pond is kind of like a bowl. And then it ends off in Drake it. Um, so the Northeast Energy Direct Proposition. It's important to note that this is a completely new pipeline from the ones that we already have in town. I know there's been a little bit of confusion about that. So we have in town the Concord Lateral Line, and I'm going to get more into what that is in a couple slides from now. But this is a brand new pipeline that they're proposing in a brand new easement in a brand new section of town. Um, they want to put a three-foot diameter pipeline. This is pretty big size. They're going back and forth between telling us whether they want to put a 30 inch or a 36 inch. Um, it's going to be operating under 1,460 pounds per square inch of pressure. And to put that in perspective to people, regular atmospheric pressure is 14. So this is 100 times more than regular. Um, it's going to be crossing Western Massachusetts, then pop up into New Hampshire for about 70 miles, a little bit more, 
and then go back down into Dracut, Massachusetts. And the reason they did that is because of something that they call co-location. And they think that that is a better market path. They talk about when they do projects like this, they have to present the one project that they want and then a couple of different alternative routes. And so what this, what's happened to us is that they've chosen now to do one of their alternative routes. Um, and if they get the 36 inch pipeline that they want, they're gonna be transmitting upwards to 2.2 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas supplies. And that is a very large amount of natural gas. Um, it's gonna be coming from the Marcellus Shale um, fracked gas from Pennsylvania to Drake at Mass, where there's a strong possibility it could reach export terminals in Canada. And I'll talk a little bit more about why we think that. And I have um, more technical people than me. I, I, most of my research has been about exactly like Pelham and what we can expect here in town. Um, so this is the Marcellus Shale. That's where that area up there in um, fracking. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about this. I don't wanna to get too technical on people right now. So it's a well stimulation technique, technique in which rock is fractured by a hydraulically pressurized liquid made of water, sand, and chemicals. And then um, Robert Rutledge has given a list of chemicals to me so that I can read some of them off and I don't know how to pronounce all of these. So um, isobutane, methyl mercop tan, butane, hexane, octane, nitrogen dioxide, nitrous, acid, styrene, methyl butane, and the list just goes on. So these are all chemicals that they are using to essentially pollute, and it takes 4.5 million gallons of water per, to frack these wells. So they're essentially polluting in each well 4.5 million gallons of water. And I think that is just astronomical numbers of water that's being polluted. Um, Cause, and there are over a million wells being drilled. And then if a well loses profitability, it is an abandoned well. And that is just a pool. And you'll see on the next slide, that's just a pool of water that is leaking methane up into the air and these chemicals down into the ground. So, um, on the plus side of fracking, it gives us an access to a domestic energy source. So that is a positive that comes out of it. But on the downside is the depletion of all the fresh water supplies and it's not a sustainable way to get energy. Um, next slide. So this is a look of that same region on the map that I was just showing you out the airplane window. And I show the slide because I wanted to give people an idea of what the gas industry does to areas to kind of prove my point that they do not care about what they do to the town of Pelham. They, are, they care about their pipeline. They don't care about the town's like water supplies. They don't care about your backyard. They don't care about your quality of life. They just care about their pipeline. So people live down there. Oh no, sorry. People live down there and um, all, and the smaller picture here is what the pool looks like. And those are all tractor trailer trucks because they bring tractor trailer truck trips of water to get it into the drill site. Um, and it also gives you a scale of how big the, the drill sites are by seeing all those trucks next to it. Um, so people live down there in that area and what happened in Pennsylvania is that a lot of people's water has been polluted to the extent where they can turn on their garden hose or their tap and light a flame to it and fire shoots out. So that's just an example of what could happen with the chemicals that they're using to frack this gas. And traces of those chemicals can come through the pipelines and I'm not saying that it's ne necessarily definitely going to leak into our water, but there's possibilities of all that stuff happening. I'm gonna take another sip of water because my mouth is getting dry. <laughs> and you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is just a picture to show that all the places in dark red are where they have the highest concentration of um, gas wells being drilled and the pink, the lighter pink and stuff is lower, lesser numbers. Um, Texas is the number one area where they're doing this and Pennsylvania and West Virginia are number two and three. And there's nothing in New Hampshire, but I, I think I just show this slide because it's, it's happening in places that you might not have been aware of that there's fracking going on. Okay, so that is the end of the fracking discussion. And next slide. Um, okay, so New England, this is from the EIA Energy, Inst I forget what that stands for, <laughs> um, but it's from a valid source and it talks about the net consumption and net generation from each state that are putting energy into the New England power grid. 
New Hampshire is a net donor of electricity. Um, they cons the yellow, okay, sorry. The bars, the yellow bars on the top are what we consume and the gray bars on the bottom are what we generate and send out to the power grid. So New Hampshire is a net donor of electricity by about half. We only consume about half of what we generate and the rest goes off to the other states. Um, and our primary power source is nuclear. And that is largely due to the Seabrook station, which is the largest individual electrical generating unit on the New England power grid. So we have the Seabrook station and a lot of people can say that that's controversial and also risky and it is. Um, but I, I just wanted to present this slide to you to show you that New England, New Hampshire necessarily doesn't need to be producing or helping the New England power grid any more than they already are. We're already doing our fair share. Um, next slide. This is the map that Kinder Morgan was showing us on Thursday night. And the little star, the little red star that I've put is next to two um, parallel lines right there. And that's the Concord lateral that runs through town. Um, the blue line, I don't know how easy it is to see, but the blue line, um, all the black lines in there are existing Tennessee gas pipeline that's already in the region. Um, the little blue line is the Constitution pipeline coming from Troy, Pennsylvania to Wright, New York. And then the purple line that goes off of that is where the Northeast Energy Direct pipeline proposition hooks into it and comes all the way down to Drake it. And there's a couple lateral lines going off of that. Um, I've put the Iroquois, I've noted that one because that is something that when I, so I went to the State Senate briefing and on Wednesday morning. And there was a, um, a representative from the Constitution Pipeline. And she was talking about how, and that, okay, so that one's already been approved by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And it's going through the final processes, I think. It's not a done deal yet, but it's going through the final processes of being completed. And sh the lady that was there representing that company was saying that that pipeline doesn't need the Northeast Energy Direct Pipeline to get, um, natural gas to the New England region. So she was claiming that hers could do one. If you talk to Kinder Morgan, they're claiming that theirs is the one that's bringing it down. So there's just a whole bunch of different projects all claiming that, they're bringing, that they are the ones bringing natural gas to the region. So it's just a lot, it's a little bit overwhelming when you think about it, but it's, it's hard to kind of process all this. So that's why I have the technical experts helping me <laughs> with all that. But um, then the gentleman um, from Kinder Morgan was also talking about the Algonquin pipeline, and that one is the one that I have running along the bottom there. And there's um, a project in the works, it's in the planning stages also, and um, with the Concord lateral in, line, in town, in the year 2000, it was an eight inch pipeline and a 12 inch pipeline that we have here in Pelham. And then the year 2000, they ripped out the eight inch one and put a 20 inch one down. So from my understanding, the Algonquin um, expansion project, the Spectra expansion project is about kind of taking that pipeline out of the ground and putting in a bigger capacity one. And that's my understanding of it. And um, then the Maritimes pipeline is up on the top there. And that one has just signed to, right now it's importing gas from Canada down to here. And that one just signed a contract or is trying to, or has already been approved, not already been approved, trying to get the gas to go from here out. And that's why a lot of speculation is happening about um, exporting it overseas because also up near a, a town that begins with the name, uh, the word, the letter B, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, there's a company, per Peride, and they, what is it? Goldboro. Nova Scotia, okay. And they are having a plan to try and get an export, an, a liquefied natural gas export terminal up there. So there's a possibility that all these new pipelines are trying to come in and expand capacity and everything, not to really benefit New England, but to export. And kind of right now they're in the process. They, so I, from, this is just my opinion too. Um, they are in the pre-filing process, kind of going out there trying to show a need, trying to show that they can grow a customer base to get this kind of to come through so that they can actually profit on their exports. But that's an opinion. I guess I can't really back that up actually right now. Because they'll tell, uh, so Kinder Morgan will also say, you know, um, 
we're just here for the, the customers that we can get for home heating and everything. Um, and then they also have to say that if uh, export or if one of those liquefied natural gas things were to become a customer, we don't discriminate against who our customers are. So like they're kind of, yeah. So, okay. I'm gonna take another sip of water. And um, next slide. And so after, after we go through all these slides, if anyone has a question and wants to go back to some of them and like get some of the people who I have in the audience who are more technical and want to ask more questions about the pipeline stuff, feel free to do that. <laughs> okay, this is a slide that I wanted to show. This is the Spectra. Um, this is from the Spectra website. This is just an example of another company's sales pitch kind of thing too. So I'm not putting favor in support of this one. I just wanted to show you like the last um, map came off of the Kinder Morgan website. This map came off of the Spectre website. So the Spectre, um, Kinder Morgan also, it was Curtis Cole told me that on, when he came here on Thursday, I asked a question like, what is the difference between your projects? And he told me that they were servicing different regions that, that um, Kinder Morgan's project that they want to bring through our town was going to service Massachusetts and New Hampshire and that the Spectre project didn't really reach those same areas. But as you can see from the Spectre project, a lot of it is in Massachusetts. So I don't really know where he was saying that for. And um, there's a dotted line that outlines, it says, and it may be hard to read, New England gas and electric markets served by Access Northeast. And Access Northeast is the name of that project, like um, the Northeast Energy Direct is the name of our project, or the projects for this town. Um, so it's a dotted line that circles Southern New Hampshire also. So I just wanted to call it out that not everything you hear from these Kinder Morgan reps that are coming through town is completely factual and accurate. And so I'm, I'm assuming that not everything you hear from this other project is exactly accurate either. So I'm not you know, pitting one against the other. I'm just kind of giving more examples of all the projects out there. Um, all those little yellow dots are called uh, gas-fired power plant connected to the Access Northeast project. So. Curtis Cole was talking about the difference between, um, okay, so Curtis Cole, when he was here, told me straight out that this project, the Northeast Energy Direct, is not needed to service Pelham. And I'm assuming that that means also Hudson, Wyndham, and Londonderry that have the Concord Lateral. Because if we needed to tap into gas, we could potentially tap into the Concord Lateral gas. So they knew that, they had to say that. Um, he was talking about the, need, the reason for this project, the main goal of this project, is to bring us all lower electricity prices. But they haven't signed on a single natural gas power plant. Um, and he said that the other side hadn't either. And I'm going to have to defer to more technical guys than me to do this one. I'll just say that a lot of power plants don't want to sign long-term contracts. They want to buy spot. So that's not necessarily a surprise. Yeah. Yep, and Kurt, um, the Kinder Morgan representative was also talking about this tariff, and he kind of like just talked right over it so that no one really ask any questions about that. Um, the tariff is the six governors of New England came together and kind of signed this contract thing that they were all going to have a tariff that would be tacked onto electric company, uh, electricity customers' bills. So and so essentially, they want all of us to foot the bill for these projects. So it would show up in our electric statements if these projects get built, which it's not a done, that's not a done deal yet. You know, that doesn't have to happen, but that's on the board for potentially happening. We could be, you know, kind of paying for all these projects. So the fact that they're telling us that our electricity prices are going to come down, at least initially, we're going to definitely see them rising up a little bit more. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that slide. Yeah. Okay. okay, just talking to the top of it, not okay. the side. So I'm um, Representative Greg Smith. I got Representative Greg Smith. Uh, so I've actually spoken with both the Kinder Morgan people and the, the uh, Spectre Energy people, and obviously they're both sandbagging the other. They Neither side wants the other pipeline to be built. What I will tell you from what I understand, though, is, which is accurate, is the Access Northwest, Northeast, Northeast, uh, they claim that they are able to upgrade existing pipeline on existing right away and that they will provide sufficient capacity increase to be able to meet the needs of New England. 
versus Kinder Morgan. Now, of course, Kinder Morgan's got a different story. The main thing that I, I just wanted to point out, what I thought was an error of fact, was the point around the tariff. This is where things get complicated. I, I don't know about the Kinder Morgan pipeline so much. At the end of the day, we pay for energy no matter what, whether we pay for it in the electricity, whether we pay for it uh, in the form of natural gas, we, we will pay for it at some point. The question is whether or not uh, uh, how, if, whether or not it gets paid for indirectly through the, the power uh, generation or we pay some sort of a, a, an upfront fee associated with the pipeline. But uh, ISO New England wants at least one of these built in order to be able to make sure that we've got enough uh, energy in place. What I am curious to know about is, is pipeline awareness, are we against all the pipelines or are we just against Northeast Direct? Pipeline awareness, so pipeline awareness started, um, Pelham Pipeline Awareness started as just a group of concerned citizens. It's basically me and four other ladies in town, and we've started a Facebook page. We've been doing our extensive research. We've been talking to other towns. We're trying to just get as much awareness as we can specifically for the town of Pelham about the project specifically for the town of Pelham. Just as a way to get information out to everybody so we don't have every single person trying to do their own little bit of information, you know. And the P Pelham Pipeline Facebook page that we have is, you know, everyone kind of chattering and like, you know, showing articles and sharing articles that you've read and stuff. So that's the point of Pelham Pipeline Awareness. I don't think we've had enough discussions to say if we're for all pipelines or just for not for this one. It's not really, it's just me and four ladies <laughs> in town. So, okay. Um, next slide, I guess. All right, so this is a picture of the Concord Lateral in town. It's the 20 inch and the 12 inch and, um, okay, so when Kinder Morgan came to town, they showed us this beautiful, like, pathway through beautiful trees and everything but i just wanted to point out to people that this runs directly through our elementary school and our middle school in town um, when it started out and, and i also put this slide up here because it's an example of what can happen on these easements so you know they want to put one pipeline in now but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always just going to be that way so when the concord lateral line started i believe 60 years ago it was two eight inch pipes side by side and then it became an eight inch and a 12 inch, and then it became a 12 inch and a 20 inch, and then it became, um, you know, and, and the Pelham Memorial School's been there for a long time, but the, the elementary school um, picture, that was built up against it, you know? So it, it, one, of the, one of the reps from Kinder Morgan was talking about how um, their easements get built up against, and that's just an example of how, you know, buildings come next to these that weren't there in the beginning and stuff. and. Um, and then in 2008, they even wanted to put more gas through these, so that's how Pelham came to have a compressor station here. And it's a small, or on scale of what they want for this new project, the compressor station they've been showing in their slides as a point of comparison is 6,000 horsepower, and the ones that they're proposing for the Northeast Energy Direct is 80,000 horsepower. And the one in Pelham sits on seven acres, and I think it's 11 total with the access road, but the ones they're proposing for this project sit on um, 50 acres or 30 acres and Drake it I think is a little bit less because it's a little bit less of um, of the kind of thing they need to actually get the gas to go through because that's the terminus point um, and okay next slide <laughs> okay this is I'm um, going to show you a video now so now we're going to get into it, like more about what you see just in Pelham so I'm going to get into a video and it was taken by a guy who was affected by the pipeline in Massachusetts his name is Stephen Wicks and I don't, I can't remember if it's going through his yard still. It still is, okay. But um, he's helping, he's going around to all these different meetings. He's been to a couple meetings in Drake it and you know, Greenville, Mass, um, Greenville, New Hampshire. And he's just going around sharing his videos. He's doing really nice documentaries. And we have one here to show to um, make everyone aware of- This is the Google Earth view of the Western Mass exactly Electric Corridor as it crosses uh, West Hill Road and Route 116 here in Plainfield, Massachusetts. We see her wetland, which comes across the corridor, wanders around and then goes to the south along Mill Brook. This view was taken in early spring, and uh, all the tan areas here are deciduous trees and make a completely thick woodland on both sides of the corridor during the late spring, summer, and fall. I can tell you that the white flag, which says proposed pipeline, is positioned right about here. And when I pace from the white flag to the edge of the corridor, and I'm calling that the edge of the corridor in the wood line. 
That's 150 feet. There's a flag, pink in color, and it's centered in the corridor over here, and that happens to be 300 feet from the white flag. And there's a corresponding pink flag 300 feet from the white pipeline in that direction. So we've got 600 feet here, 150 feet from the corridor edge here, the proposed pipeline. And if, as we've heard, there's a 50-foot swath on either side of the pipeline that's necessary for construction, that means that a 100-foot swath of trees, at least, will be taken out through the woods right in that direction, which seems to leave a buffer of trees between, and then you would have two corridors. On my way out to the post office, I saw a truck and equipment indicating a survey crew was back again. No one was around, but I assumed since they had set up a signal device that they might have been off into the woodland and shooting lines again. I walked down the road and when I approached the truck, I wanted to see where they were from and uh, hatch Mott McDonald from Holyoke, Mass. And I moved around the back of the truck to see the license plate and I could now see they were from Louisiana. Uh, looked up in the back of the truck, I could see the stakes that would go along with the survey. The sign on the dashboard says Kinder Morgan Project Vehicle. Tennessee Gas Pipeline Company, uh, Northeast Energy Direct. Then it says questions or concerns with a question mark after it, but the space below is blank and it seems like there should be a phone number there or some contact information or something. Anyway, then looking back over to the corridor, I guess the guys must be out there somewhere. Just following in their footsteps here through the deep weeds. All right, so here I am deep in the woods. Now we're looking at proposed pipeline P period I. We've got this up here. Now if we look over here to the left, I walked in about 50 paces. That seems consistent with the 150 feet along the road. Now a very long strip of the land on this side of the corridor is owned by Western Mass Electric. Uh, but I believe this section right down here by West Hill Road I think it's a 35-acre parcel, if I recall, and it's privately owned, I believe. And if that's so, then the owner must have given permission for the survey. I have this Google Earth map now uh, in a wider view and more flat. And what we can see here is the corridor running through. And this is West Hill Road coming off of 116. And the earlier views have been right down in this region here and a little bit more of an oblique angle. I have this view in place because I've just come back from Summit Road, which is over here at this distance, and walking from the corridor edge, uh, 55 paces, the pin is there with the white flag on it that says proposed pipelines. So it winds up pretty much with the pin that's down here, which suggests that the proposed pipeline route marked by the white flags is running absolutely parallel to the corridor, but 150 feet in from the edge of the wood line. So if the pipeline is buried in an excavated trench, vast numbers of trees are going to disappear, uh, certainly in this section and I would think in many places along the entire NED route. If hydraulic directional drilling is used, it seems like many trees will be spared except for, for the staging areas for the heavy drilling equipment to gain access and workspace. Toward the end of the afternoon, I was going out for errands and saw the truck pulled over on the side by the equipment two guys in it and another truck from Louisiana idling next to them. Three guys were talking. I walked up and I uh, asked about the project. I said, I noticed the white flags with the proposed pipeline. They said, yeah, that's the exact route that the pipeline would take. I asked them about the uh, outlying pink lines. It's, I said, it looks like it was about a 600 foot wide swath. And they said, oh no, those were just reference points that they would use to set their equipment up. And as they went through the woods, they could shoot lines based on those two points. I also then said it looked like there'd be two corridors side by side given that the pipeline route was 150 feet away from the edge of the wood line and well, one guy just looked at me and said, well, I don't, you know, we just do what we're told and he said, I, I think it just has to do with the distance uh, between the power lines and the pipe. Aware of their heavy southern accents, I smiled as I looked down at the sign on the side of the door and I said, so you're from Holyoke, Mass? And they said, no, we're not from up here, but uh, we do work out of that office. And we all smiled, and I thanked them for the information they'd given me, and I just said goodbye. Many people opposed to the pipeline have questioned how many of the jobs Kinder Morgan says will be created would be local. 
If the early basic survey work is not being done by local workers, what does that suggest about the potential for jobs in Massachusetts or New Hampshire if the proposed project is ever built? Okay, so that was just to show everybody that um, when, when I first heard about this, you know, um, the, you know, I had the land survey guy knocking on my door and then I told my husband about it and he said, oh, well, they're probably just gonna wanna widen it back there. You know, like I figured, well, maybe I could live with that. And then I started doing my research and saw this video and a bunch of other different things and they are asking to survey a 400 foot wide corridor um, or 400 foot wide area from the edge of that power line easement and they could put the pipeline anywhere within that 400 feet. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're just widening the um, power lines like they were talking about at the Thursday night's meeting. It could mean that they could come in 300 feet, 200 feet, wherever works best for their pipeline. So that's just to clarify that. And then here we have the Merrimack Valley Reliability Project. This is a completely separate project from the Kinder Morgan. The only reason I'm showing it on these slides is because it affects um, it goes through Pelham, Wyndham, Hudson, and Londonderry, and it's the power line row. And they are, there's, right now, if you, if you look in the power lines, you see the two outside ones, those are steel towers, and that little one in the middle is a wooden tower, and it's a little bit shorter. They are going to take that one out and transplant it over to the edge of the row, the right of way, and put um, in its place, put a, it's an 85 foot tall steel tower with 345 kilovolt transmission line running down the middle to get electricity from, um, New Hampshire down into Massachusetts. And the wooden pole that they're transplanting on the side, the wooden pole that they're transplanting on the side is gonna be still bringing electricity from Massachusetts up. What this means for our project, and you can skip to the next slide because it'll show what it will look like when it's done. If, and I, I don't know if this is 100% a done thing. I think it is, but um, this is what it will look like after. So um, in parts of Pelham, um, when they're running on the right side, which is right near my house, they are going to put the pipeline um, right next to where the new one has been transplanted or whatever. But for safety reasons during construction and safety reasons for corrosion on the pipe, it can't be, it needs to be a certain distance away, which is why I think they might have been doing that 100 foot um, survey that you saw in the video. It needs to be a certain distance away because of the uh, stray currents, or they were calling it. And um, I asked Kinder Morgan if they would be responsible for the induction of current studies and that's, they, they would be responsible for placing their pipe, you know, in a safe distance away from that. Um, I, my question that I didn't really get answered was, how are they going to run these two timelines side by side? Like, wouldn't they need to do the studies after the new pipe, the new transmission line was actually in town, if that makes sense? Um, so part of what I want to do tonight is just, it's, it's all going to be recorded, amass a list of questions that we all have, because I don't even have all my, questions answered yet and then hand them to the Board of Selectmen because I know that um, Board of Selectmen members are working to gather all these questions and pose them to the company and they might have a little bit more clout than the average citizen because I've fired off a ton of questions to Kinder Morgan and I haven't heard back yet so hopefully that's one thing we can accomplish. Um, next slide. Okay, the, um, so for the Merrimack Valley Reliability Project, the anticipated construction is to start in 2016 and the anticipated in-service date is 2018 and that's kind of the timeline that Kinder Morgan is working off of as well. And um, that's just a little picture that explains that it needs to be far away and they use certain chemicals and stuff, um, certain chemicals for the coating um, outside of their pipe to keep it safe from corrosion. And I don't, I mean, uh, Kinder Morgan would be responsible. Yeah, I already said that. Um, oh, and then another question that this raised for me was that if any of the power lines along the route were to move closer to the edge of the right of way in the future, would the pipeline then have to be ripped out and moved further? Like, it would limit stuff that could happen between the power lines and the pipelines because co-location might not be the best. They're saying it would be, and I think that they're saying it would be easier to do this or better to do this alternative route so that it would have less impact to landowners because they'd be co-locating with the right of way. But I really don't think that that is a very accurate statement on their part either. Mm, okay, next slide. This is another um, piece of infrastructure that we could expect to see if we had this pipeline come through town. It's a valve station. Um, this is for a 30 inch pipeline. The picture that, they, that Kinder Morgan was showing at their open houses was for much smaller and it was for a 12 inch pipeline. So I asked them to get me a more accurate picture and they had done that. 
Um, it's proposed for every 10 miles along the route with permanent access roads to each where routine maintenance or routine pressure control is performed. Routine pressure control is a nicer way of saying blow off um, when they let out a bunch of the natural gas up into the air to regulate pressure within the pipe. Um, 10 miles is an average. At the town meeting in Merrimack that I watched, Kinder Morgan was saying that it was eight miles. And in the town meeting for Litchfield that I watched, Kinder Morgan was telling them 15 miles apart. So I think it depends upon population density. Um, this is an above ground structure. It would be fenced off and locked for safety reasons, but um, it would also, and the Kinder Morgan reps at the Pelham meeting told us this, it would also have to be placed a certain distance away, probably a little bit further than the rest of the pipe. I'm not 100% sure because of the blow offs would have to be a far enough distance away from the transmission lines to be safe also. Um, access roads to these for routine maintenance. I had a question that hasn't been answered yet. Would that also be coming from our properties? Would they need to maybe take a little bit more from someone's property wherever this is going to be located? And I think there might be one in Pelham. I'm not sure because they haven't told us exactly where they're going to be. So, next slide. Um, okay, before we go to, I have a video. Um, before we go to the video, this is a test that they run after construction. Um, to check the strength of the pipeline. Um, I think that they run the test from these valve stations. I'm not 100% sure, but so the first video we're gonna watch is from a different pipeline company because I couldn't find one from Kinder Morgan, but it's like a, it's an industry video about what a hydrostatic test is. And I'm gonna let you watch that because it would be better than me trying to explain it. Southern California Gas Company is the nation's largest distributor of natural gas, providing safe, reliable service to nearly 21 million customers through more than 4,000 miles of transmission pipeline. Safety is our highest priority, so we routinely conduct tests designed to measure that pipeline segments are sound, often referred to as pipeline integrity. One of the common methods for assessing pipeline integrity is the hydrostatic pressure test. Hydrostatic pressure testing is a process that uses water to exert pressure on a pipeline at levels greater than its usual operating pressure. The segment of pipeline that is being tested is temporarily removed from service by closing the nearest valves on both ends to stop the flow of natural gas. Then the natural gas left inside the pipeline is safely vented. Excavations are dug at both ends of the segment to expose the pipeline. Short sections of pipeline are removed from both ends of the segment to be tested and the ends are sealed with test head caps and end caps. Next, water from nearby water tanks is pumped into the test head cap which also contains a foam plug. The pumped water propels the plug through the test segment pushing the air out and filling it fully with water. The water pressure is then increased to a point higher than the pipeline will normally operate to see if it has any leaks. After holding the increased pressure for eight hours or more, the test is complete. If the hydrostatic pressure test results in a leak or a rupture, the segment will be repaired or replaced. After a successful test, Compressed air is used to push the foam plug through the pipeline test segment and drain the water back into the water tanks. The water is then disposed of in accordance with applicable regulations and local requirements. The test head caps are removed and multiple foam plugs are pushed through the pipeline segment until it is thoroughly dried. Once the pipeline segment is completely dry, the remaining end caps are removed and new pre-tested replacement pipe is installed at both ends of the segment to reconnect it into the system. Nitrogen gas is then injected into the restored pipeline segment and natural gas from a partially open valve pushes it to the other side to vent the remaining air. Natural gas is safely reintroduced into the pipeline and it is brought back into service by fully opening the valves. Finally, the excavated areas are graded and restored as closely as possible to their pre-construction condition. Hydrostatic pressure testing is one of the many tools Southern California Gas Company uses to help maintain the safety and integrity sure, of our natural gas pipeline system. 
Okay, so that was the company version of what a hydrostatic test is, but then I found a video on YouTube because I did a little bit of digging around about what a hydrostatic test looks like in real person, and now this, this um, video is a successful hydrostatic test, so keep that in mind also. And I'm going to talk over it because it's just long, but no words. This is just someone who lives near a pipeline and went out and found a video of it, and it's just... That's water and air being shot up into the air after the hydrostatic test is completed and they're drying out the insides of it. So this, um, this, when I watched this video, this spurred a lot of questions in my mind and I'm just going to say them out loud now so they're like recorded on, and then we can hand this to the Board of Selectmen and they know all my specific questions and I'm going to read them. Um, how far apart are the valve stations placed along the proposed route, which we've been told 10 miles, is that accurate? And that would mean 10 miles worth of water continually going through this, and that's 10 miles worth of air being dried out. Um, is there a permanent access road leading to the valve stations that would also be obtained from private properties and or conservation lands? Please list the towns where the valve stations will be located. I understand hydrostatic, te hydrostatic testing is part of the construction process. Is it also routine maintenance? How often will this routine maintenance occur? Where does the company propose to get the water to use for these tests? Um, that question is because I watched another um, town hall meeting from Pennsylvania and the gentleman stood up to the microphone like we were doing the other night and he let everyone know that they asked him, not Kinder Morgan but a different company, asked him um, to rent 100,000 gallons of water out of his pool that he had or a pond that he had on his property. So I think they're trying to, they, and I don't know for sure, that's why I'm asking this question, want to take local water to use for these tests. Yeah. Yeah. This is, so they capture it, so they capture it in um, the things, but then it gets, it's, it's all wet inside still. So then this is when they're shooting air through it. This is when they're shooting air through it to dry out everything. Oh, okay, sorry. I'll, yeah, if you, wanna, if you wanna ask a question, just walk right up there. I'm talking to the top of the microphone. How to test? How they were testing, and I thought this was—I uh, was misunderstanding. It looked like after they tested, they captured the water and treated it, but this looks like water just being discharged. Yeah. So this, so this is, is the final cleanup. This is the final cleanup. So they—they they catch most of the water, but then it's still wet inside of the inside of the so pipe. So they're putting air through it to dry it out, and they shoot that up. So this should be reasonably clean. <laughs> Ahead. The research that I've done uh, found that they use methylene chloride, which is a DCM. It's very toxic. Uh, they will dry the pipeline with this prior DCM, dichloromethane. Yeah, and they uh, they pass it through the pipe with a headspace of nitrogen to push it all out, which is a very toxic chemical. Which, when they're first building the pipe, I don't think that any of the chemicals, when they do the first initial test of this, if, if this comes in, I don't think that there will be any chemicals found in that because it will be a brand new pipe. I, I could be wrong. But if this, was, if this were to be routine maintenance, and it's kind of like a catch-22 because you don't want, I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't really want that much water happening right near where I live, you know, for flooding reasons. But then also you kind of would want it if it was here to make sure you're getting the safest, you know, then all the maintenance and stuff. So, um, more of my questions. Where does the company propose to get the water for these tests? Where does the company propose to dump the water after these tests are complete? I read something that said that they are, they, it would all depend on their permit, pre-construction permitting. So they could dump it into a sewer cap or a sewer, or they could dump it into an empty field. Um, how significant could the flooding be to my property in case of a leak during these tests? Supposing this pipeline is 200 feet away from my house, for example. How significant could the flooding be to my property from the air water blasting up out of the valves while the pipes are being dried after the hydrostatic test is complete? Um, and by the way, it, it mentioned if there was a leak or a break. If there was a leak or a break during one of these tests, um, the water damage would be significant and on scale with um, a water main break. So if, you know, okay. Um, what compensation is guaranteed for property damage resulting from a hydrostatic test? How significant could the flooding be to my property if the company obtains a permit to dump the water after testing on or near my property? 
What types of contaminants does the company check for in the water before discarding it after testing? What happens if those contaminants end up in my groundwater and adversely affect the water in my well? Does the company cover the cost of private well testing after each hydrostatic testing? How often does the company propose to inspect the right of way by air or ground? And the, um, my question is just kind of like all spurred off from watching this video, so some of them aren't exactly related to hydrostatic testing. If a snowmobile decides to use this proposed easement for winter recreation, what recourse is there to ensure no trespassing on my property occurs, even though the easement is not owned specifically by me? Um, and then I, I kind of went off tangent even more. Galvanic corrosion continues to be one of the most commonly encountered engineering problems. Can the company clearly define listing all specific materials used, their methods to limit corrosion both within and without their proposed pipeline? What chemicals are found in the protective coating on the exterior of the pipes? What chemicals can be expected to be found within the pipes? I've watched videos from pipeline company websites, much like the one that I showed you all, of workers placing caution radioactive area signs during hydrostatic testing. Can you please in detail explain why, there are, why they are placing radioactivity signs near the pipeline construction? Can we expect radioactivity with this specific proposed pipeline? How far away from the power lines and EMF does a gas pipeline need to be for safety reasons? We asked that question and we just got, well, for safety reasons it needs to be far, but they couldn't give us specific numbers, barring, I guess, their induction of current studies. How far away from the power lines does a gas pipeline need to be for safety reasons during construction? And then I asked them to please list exact machinery of construction vehicles used during proposed construction for this specific pipeline. <laughs> so those were just some examples of questions that I'm hoping we can gather to hand to our board of selectmen. Um, additional costs that aren't maybe thought of. Um, if, if this pipeline gets to the point where Kinder Morgan wants it and they're going to come through town and start negotiations, negotiations for easements, we should all probably get lawyers and that can be expensive. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend negotiating, negotiating for an easement with this company without some legal counsel. Um, well damage compensation. Um, Mr. Dadak, actually, you have a well damaged story about from the blasting. Yeah, we have, we have Microphone. Uh, well, I'm, at, I'm at the planning board, but I live on the southwestern part of town, and we have a problem with getting water out of the ground in that part of town. My well is 700 feet deep, and my neighbor's is five, and the neighbor across the street is 1,200. And there is a subdivision in the area that was built in the late 80s, and there was a very difficult time getting water out of the ground, a scenic view. And what had happened was a, a subdivision is being developed on the top of the hill, off Spalding Hill. And this is back, um, I don't know, within the last several months. There was blasting up there to put, a, I believe, a foundation. And a, a neighbors um, downhill indicated that the, when that blast occurred, according to them, their well stopped producing. And it was 18, I think it was 1,800 feet, 2,000 feet away from where the blasting was. This wasn't blasting for a pipeline. It wasn't blasting for utilities. It was blasting to put in a house. So I, I can't absolutely say there was a connection or there wasn't. They're still discussing it. So that was another question. I don't know whether you're going to put on your questions. Uh, we do live in the Granite State. And to bury this line, there's probably going to be spots where we're going to have to blast. So the town of Pelham, is a, as I understand, has a fairly restrictive uh, regulation for blasting for anything where the fire department gets involved. Uh, they have to, have to have a plan, but that's something that would probably be part of installation of any sub subsurface utility. So it's something the town has to be concerned. Well, make sure that it's properly regulated. And Kinder Morgan also says that if, if they find that they're responsible for any disruption to your well or properties during construction that they would they would compensate you for it. But now the key words there are if they find. And, and if they find that and you have to go to compensation for it, it's also probably, again, going to involve courts and lawyers and stuff. So just stuff so, to consider that it could get expensive. I'm not saying there would have been, might be a connection maybe in the future if that happened. But uh, if it's uh, basically the homeowner and Kinder Morgan would have to have, a, let's say, this a discussion of whether it was a connection there wasn't. And I, I don't know whether the Kingdom Warden would absolutely say there was, if there was a, who knows? We'll find out. Yeah. Um, the other part of that is flooding compensation, if there were any flooding from the hydrostatic tests or anything like that. Um, also, when, when, when you clear trees, so trees in, in I've been learning this because I'm going to join the Conservation Commission hopefully here in town, um, but trees keep groundwater in the ground. And when you take out the trees and 
make a big clearing like that, it could reroute water or make water happen. Like you, you, there is a potential for flooding in your basement where before you didn't have it if there's a big tree clearing like they're proposing. Not necessarily going to happen, but just keep it on the radar, I guess, for you know your own food for thought. Um, well testing. So personally, I feel that if this, I, I'm, I want to get my well tested before this project comes to pass. And if it does come, come to pass, I'm going to want to get my well tested every year for the rest of my life because I drink my tap water. I don't buy bottled water on a matter of principle and I don't want to spend money for water that I can get for free. But I also don't want to be feeding my one and a half year old polluted water. So I will be doing well testing and I, I, you know, that's an additional cost that you might not think about. Um, fire department and police detail for during construction and everything else. Decrease in property value. Now this one, a lot of times, is a kind of touchy subject because some people think that having a gas pipeline on your property could increase it. And I'm not going to even bother arguing it. I'm just saying that if you had an acre and then all of a sudden you have 0.8 of an acre, to my mind that means your value of your property is decreased. Um, a loss in tax revenue to the town after new house assessments and property tax abatement, abatements are sought. And I'm, I, I use the trees in my backyard. We cut down one a year and we heat, heat our home from a wood stove. So that would probably need to be in the negotiations to have them get the trees. But I don't think he's here tonight, but I spoke to a gentleman who lived on, um, he lives on the Concord lateral line on election day. And he told me that that was one of the things that he requested from the company when they came in and did their construction and took out the eight inch and put the 20 inch down and they were gonna cut trees and everything. He said that he wanted to have the trees. So could they leave the trees there for him so that he could use them? So what happened was he came home, the construction was already done and he was looking and watching them feed the trees that he asked for them to leave through a wood chipper. So you really have to, even if it's negotiated for beforehand, you really need to just catch them right there and then if they're gonna leave you the trees or not. Um, so then I'm going to, the last thing I'm going to say here is we have a jar on the table. Um, it's over there on the table. If you want to please make donations just to help and all the proceeds for that is going to go towards fighting to have this pipeline stopped and not come through town. Next slide. All right. So these are where you can find information, New Hampshire pipeline awareness.org, no fact gas and mass.org, massplan.org, stop New York pipeline.org. And I should have put on there, but I ran out of room. Pelham Pipeline Awareness Facebook page, you can ask to join. Donna Butler is doing a phenomenal job getting all the information to us. Um, things that we can do. So, no trespassing. This is actually a, a brand new no trespassing sign that was posted up around town because of this pipeline specifically. Um, we, if you don't want surveyors coming onto your property, your best recourse is to post no trespass. Comment to FERC on the next slide that we're gonna leave up because this is the coming to the end of the presentation, hopefully just get it to the open forum stuff. But the next slide is um, a step-by-step -step direction on how to comment to FERC. And FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They're the ones who can give Kinder Morgan the certificate to get this going and give them the certificate to use eminent domain and all that stuff. Um, write to your elected officials, and we have handouts on the table over there about who they are, who you should be writing to, what their email addresses are, and the rest of it. S post your property for no trespass. Sign deny access um, to survey forms, or you can rescind access to survey too. It, this, they're in pre-filing. It's way too early for them to say they, they're, they want access to survey, but you don't have to give it to them at this early stage in the process. Later on, you can always change your mind and give it to them later if, as it gets closer and you want a better negotiating ground if that is what your wish is. But for right now, don't feel like you have to let them come onto your property. Um, it, it's your property. You can do with it as you wish. Um, we have a couple of petitions to sign in the back. Um, one of them is, we're gonna, so when you sign the petition, they're all in separate pages. There's enough room to leave a comment if you want to as well, but just leave them here. We're gonna collect them all in mass and present them to Governor Hassan all in one fell swoop. So you don't have to take that with you. That's something that we would do. Um, there was something else that I wanted to say that you should leave here too, and I can't think of it. I'll get back to it. Um, things that you can do to help your energy costs. You can weatherize your home. That's something individually that you can do. Yeah? You don't mind mentioning on the pipeline awareness that we have a petition? 
Okay, yeah, um, NewHampshirePipelineAwareness.org also has the petition that we have in the paper form. If you, want to, if you would rather just sign it right online, you can just go ahead right online and do that. And we've posted it to Pelham Pipeline Awareness, and you can find it all over Facebook and stuff as well. Um, solar panels, um, that's a good recommendation if you wanted to look into having solar panels on your home, and that's just to bring your own personal electricity bills down. There are other things you can do. I don't pay the bills at my house anymore. I'm a stay-at-home mom right now. <laughs> but um, there are other things you can do to be a, a better customer of electricity and shop around a little bit to get better prices from different carriers and stuff. Um, so the last thing that I would recommend to do, and I, I, I'm probably going to maybe head this in town, I don't know yet, is to start a town energy committee. So I just want to give a little bit of commendation to Doug Viger. I was here at the um, Board of Selectmen meeting the other night, and he proposed something to get all the lighting in this building. And I don't know if the schools, but for sure this building, all on LED lighting. So the town is already taking steps to help our electricity prices and help the costs of town and stuff. Um, I was just reading a newspaper article about Bill Ricca putting a solar panel um, like kind of area on top of an old landfill. And I know we have an old landfill here in town on off of Simpson Mill Road, I think. So I would kind of like to maybe mention to Doug Viger or whoever needs to be involved in that if that is a potential for something to do here to help electricity and everything too. Um, so now we're gonna go over to the FERC, the next slide. And I'm just going to leave this up here. That number at the top is PF1422. That's the docket number. So that's the one on this website that will take you to the Northeast Energy Direct project where you can leave comments to them and stuff. This is also posted on our Facebook page. And we also have a handout of it. So you don't need to take notes. <laughs> There's a handout of it you can grab. And it has this all listed out. And I'm going to leave that up here. And now I'm going to go to open forum discussion. Um, talk, ask questions. Mr. Hallisey is going to kick us off. I know he has a couple of things to say. And OK. Yeah, if you guys want to take a break and get a coffee or a cookie or a piece of baklava fresh baked over here. <laughs> Quick break. I guess we're ready. I was here la uh, last week. My name is George Hallisey, and I am the president of the Boulder Hills Condominium Association off of Jericho Road, Winterberry Road. We've been there now five years. The project was started eight years ago. <clears throat> there are 24 units, townhouses there. And I represent all 24, as each, is, each one is a separate homeowner, pays taxes like everybody else. Our area, where we're at, okay, is the closest, I think, of anything on that map you can see to where that, that pipeline will go in. As a matter of fact, the last unit, it's a large unit, with a propane gas tank in the ground right beside it, heading towards the new pipeline will be no more than 200 feet. So how can that company, how can they come in here and say that they're going to put a pipeline in our area and come that close to one of our houses? And also, all 24 units are within the 1,000 foot area that if there ever was a fire explosion, we're gone. We're all gone. Now, at the last meeting we were here at, <clears throat> I asked some questions and I didn't get answers. And if it's, it's my responsibility, by the way, as being the president of this townhouse association, to represent all these people, to protect them. When you sign and raise your hand and you volunteer to be the president of the association, by state law, you're to carry and conduct yourself as though you're a president of a corporation. That's right in the bylaws. There's a lot of responsibilities for all right here on these shoulders. And I take it very, very seriously. I also am a retired businessman. And when I spoke to these business people right over here last week, 
they totally frustrated me because they wouldn't answer a lot of questions I asked them. So, <clears throat> they spoke last week, if you were here. How many were here last week? Raise your hands. Quite a bit. If you notice, they spoke in what I call natural gas engineering terms. And I'll bet you if we gave a quiz, if they gave a quiz to us after that meeting, I don't think any of us would have passed it. We might have been lucky to get one question right. That to me is not communicating with us as citizens and us as, 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 as part of this town. <clears throat> they had no answers for some tough questions. One of the questions that I asked them is, would you, would you admit that the reason you are here, okay, is to run your pipelines up to be able to move gas, pot, natural gas from the Michelle gas, but actually all the way down from Houston, up into Nova Scotia, where you can fill the tankers and ship it overseas and make, not millions, billions of dollars in profit. That's what they did. They wouldn't answer. All I had to do was say yes. All I had to do was say yes. That's what the, our goal is here, is to be able to move this new wealth coming from this country out and make millions and millions of dollars. And they wouldn't answer some other questions that other people had. Now, they said, uh, where is, okay, you, you mentioned before that you said there were two million cubic feet coming through the pipeline per minute? Is that what you said? 2.2 2. 2 billion cubic feet per day. Two million per day, okay. I did some, I did some research also. This is kind of interesting. I'll show you the money that's involved here. If for no other reason, we don't want them, they don't help us, they don't generate anything for us here, we're gonna get by just as fine without it. So don't bother us, leave. Take a hike. We don't want you here. You can make your millions, okay? Find some other way to do it. 1,000 cubic feet of natural gas is $4 per 1,000 square foot here. China is paying $16 a cubic foot. $4 to 16 Now, the average tanker, when they ship this stuff up through our town, the average tanker in Nova Scotia, in, in, up in Nova Scotia, will fill up with 3 billion cubic feet of gas. Which means, at the $4 mark, we're looking at $12 million for a tanker for them to make going over. At $16, they're looking at $64 million. You see why they want to come through our town? You see why they want to be here? Now, we're in a tough position here right now. Oh, and I wanted to be a couple other things I picked up about Kinder. They're not the perfect angels that they made out to be here. <clears throat> there is a, um, a pipeline and hazardous material safety administration that checks on these various companies. In 2011, this company cited Cinder Morgan for these safety violations. Failure to maintain update maps showing picture line pipeline locations. Whoa. <laughs> They didn't give that to us last week. They haven't given that to anybody. They gave me a map with my street not even, not even mentioned on it. Winterberry with the last one, the last W. With the last one on there. When did they take that What picture? And this was a satellite picture. A satellite picture. Never showed it. Never showed her the map. That's what they've done to everybody. Can I say one thing about that? So yesterday I was going door to door, just getting, kind of eyeballing where the power lines were, knocking on doors, telling them about the meeting tonight. 
come back up. You're not leaving for good, right? Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I knocked on a door for a house that looked relatively new, and I think he said it was like within three years built. They came to his house, but there are other houses on the route that they haven't visited because they claimed that they're, it, when, and we kind of thought it was because their maps were from the 1980s or like really old maps that they were working off of why they haven't contacted everybody. But they did contact this gentleman and his house is a fairly new house. So it's just really confusing as to why some of us are being contacted by them and getting land survey permissions and some of us aren't. Here's, a, here's another one. Wait, here's another one here. This is, this is, these are five points. Next one is failing to test pipeline safety devices. Interesting. Next one, failing to maintain proper firefighting equipment. Last one, failure to adequately monitor pipes corrosion levels. In 2013, the Wall Street Journal, okay, <coughs> came out and said, they're worried about Kinder Morgan's safety record. The pipeline shat slashes and defers maintenance spending was a concern to anyone who lived or worked near a Kinder Morgan pipeline. I don't want to live near that. I don't want the 24 people that I represent to have to live through that. I just don't want to do that. We can get technical, and they can get technical all they want. We have to remember one thing. They want to be here. They want to make billions of dollars at the expense of us. And they're going to tell you falsehoods. They're going to tell you lies, as they've already found out to be. They're going to give us outdated maps. That map that they gave me when I was standing, and I asked them a question. They were standing right there. Did you ever come down and see where we live? No. Well, how can you look at that map, if you're looking at the right map and everything else, know that there's one location with 24 houses right there. We each have single. These are 24, and we're so close, it's pathetic, and you have never came down there and looked at it. Plus, we have wetlands that backs right up to that line, too. That, to me, is enough to stop this whole thing right there. That's all they could say. We'll get down there. We'll look at it. They won't look at it because I won't let them on our property. Now, I think the only way that we're going to really stop this is the people. It's the people. Other places around the country have stopped it by the people. Can't afford lawyers at three, four hundred dollars an hour to come in and throw in a hundred, four hundred hours of, of stuff and throw a bill to us as the as the. Uh, as the taxpayers. You can't do that. All right? You, me, and we as a group, okay, have to come together to stop it. It's the only way it's going to be. <coughs> now tonight, I was hoping tonight we'd get a couple of hundred people in here. And my rough count is they're looking about 70 to 80 people here. Now, can this group, can we each Get hold of one or two other people to get them involved in this. We can start that pyramid. That's what it's going to take. Because I got an idea. I've got an idea. First of all, land values and reputation of the town, not going to help. If we roll over and let them win, they'll be laughing all the way to the bank. We get them people up in New Hampshire. We got them. We conned them. We conned them. Now, 200 people, 400 people, maybe 600, who knows? On a Saturday after mo afternoon or Saturday morning on the town lawn out here, we had a rally. We had a movement, okay? A movement of people. You had friends, relatives, anybody you get a hold of to come out there in, in, in volume of people. We come out there, and we, and this group over here has done a fabulous job. We'll contact Channel 9, Channel 51, 
I'll get a hold of my because there's some people who get some of the four, five, and seven down in down in Boston. We'll get a hold of the the, the uh, Concord Monitor, Manchester Union Leader, National Telegraph, and local papers. That there's a movement, there's a protest happening in Pelham. The town is against this. You know, when you turn your TV on every night, you see some group protesting somewhere. Why can't it be Pelham? Is that going to send a message to these people? And we're going to put a fight up. We're going to stop them. You can't come on my, on my, on my property. No, I'm not going to let you on there. You can't do it. And we have to have information coming back over here. Any which way to help the group, okay, to be able to come back with them with a knock. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. That's what's going to take it, in my opinion. We also have... Um a sign up sheet if you want to keep current with the emails and stuff you can sign your name on that if you want to volunteer to help us get more signatures on the petitions one lady already came up to me and tonight and told me that she would help stand in front of the Hannaford with me and sign getting petitions and stuff so if you want to volunteer if you're interested in getting more active in volunteering please reach out to us and we'll you know work to get more awareness about this in Pelham. And I think a lot more people in Pelham know about this than are here tonight, to be fair. There's a lot okay. more people on. We have, we have about 200, Don, how many people are on our Pelham? 220. So there's, a, there's people who are paying attention that might not just be able to make it down here tonight. But I, I agree, we need to up 220. There's, you know, I don't know the exact population in Pelham, but it's a lot more than 220, so. Would you, would you come to a Saturday morning at the town lawn here if we knew we had a group? Would you come? Bring other people with you? All right? That, that's the kind of, that's the power, okay? The power in the people right there alone. And some other towns in Massachusetts have done this. And they've got together like that. It's a groundswell. But now we have to get the message out there showing things. Signs, pictures, everything else like that. I brought a bag. Years ago, I know the best way was when I went to church, or, and even since then, if you want to raise a little money, maybe pass the hat, pass the bag. Because here's the thing, this girl over here has spent hundreds of dollars out of her pocket, and some of her people helping her. It's out of their own pocket. I like to, I'll donate first and just pass it around. Anything you want to put, anything you put in there to help them, give them that money, to be able to get the signs, okay, that we can put up into the local businesses. They'll, they'll put signs in there for us. They don't want the pipeline if we don't want it. So if I walk into Hannaford's, it would be nice to see a sign on the entrance and going out about the pipeline and maybe a meeting or a big, a big movement we're going to have there. Isn't that a reminder to people? Okay? And then, also, they, <clears throat> they want to be able to print out some flyers to get them into everybody's post office box. I'll volunteer to go out to some streets and put them in. I know they got enough volunteers. That's what we need to do is get it in front of people without it being in front of them and they live on the other side of town. Oh, pipeline? How do you spell that? All right. So I'm going to start this myself right here and pass it around. I hope they like this. Huh? I hope you like this. All right. Thank you. That's okay, Mrs. Singleton. That's okay, don't. That's okay. I just wanted to say something. A few years ago, and I appreciate George's passion, but a few years ago, I, I'm not going to name names, but somebody said about our drug problem, just say no. Did it work? No. So by pa being passionate about just say no, we don't want the pipeline. I think Kayla mentioned that she's trying to put together facts. We need to give facts to the, peop the powers that be so they will understand for the many number of reasons this might not be a good idea. If you just say no, we don't want the pipeline, uh, you've got to back it up with, with facts. And the devil's in the details. And I wanted to bring up one thing that was brought up earlier by George. 
Kinder Morgan passed out a plan last Thursday. And they said this is the route, the planned route for the proposed pipeline. And they gave some details. And I think uh, Dave Hennessy was up. Other people have asked directly, why is it you're saying this is the plan when the plan on you, that you gave to Amherst was different and the plan you have on the website was different from this plan? How, was, how do we have three plans that are all correct? And they, couldn't, they wouldn't answer it as far as I remember. And the other thing, co-location co is the thing that is the real, really bothers me. It's, it sounds like a really nice word, but when National Grid was here about a week or so ago, they were talking about their power line easement. And they, were, they didn't say it exactly in these words, but it was pretty direct. The gas line will not be on our easement. If it's built anywhere, it might be parallel to that easement, but it's not going to be on the easement because it just can't be physically on the easement. So the when, I think co when I first start co-location, no problem. They'll keep the same right of way and they'll just put the gas line in so it won't be as bad as maybe. Yeah, and, but you and look at this plan even, and I, I just noticed there's some, some company called Hatch Mott McDonald from Holyoke, Massachusetts that puts this together. I think we heard about them earlier. It says right on their plan, NED, where is it? They, they talk about the right of way, the existing right of way is what, 400 feet? Taylor? It's about 400 feet for the power line easement, if I remember correctly. Well, if you're going to take a power line easement and you can't put a gas line on it, you're going to have to go parallel or somewhere near it, but not on it. So my way, I'm pretty simple in math. If you've got 400 feet to work in, but you can't work in that 400 feet, you've got to probably add, what, 80, 100 feet to it, maybe? So it's not really co-located. I'm thinking the, my The mind. representatives from Kinder Morgan the other night were talking about maybe using a small little portion as part of their construction in the actual easement. So if you remember the pictures of the, the uh, Plainville, the Plainville? Yeah. And they were showing, in that case, there was a, a, a swath that was cut, and they were talking about maybe cutting a bigger swath, but they own that, the power company, the gas company owned that easement, not the power line. The easement, and I think the easement is deeded specifically for phone lines and um, transmission so, lines. It's so not deeded for a pipeline. So if you look at the plan so and it's reasonably somewhat almost close to their path, it's not 400 feet across. It can't be. It's got to be wider. So it's a devil in the details. We tried to pin them down last week. I think Kaylee's tried to pin them down trying to find details and it's like picking up jello. The long and the short of it though, you've got to fight with facts. You can, and you want to make, have a motion but you want to be able to go with a whole list of facts. Actually Hal Lined is planning for uh, Board of Selectmen rep and he had asked the other night to put facts together so every, everything that's, many of the things that Kayla mentioned, you want to put, this is what they're saying, this is what we understand is the truth, and this is why it might not be a good idea to build in Pelham. I'm not saying you can't do it, but there has to be facts behind it. So forget about just, don't say, just say no. Just say no because. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now Rich Cowan's from Drakeit, and he is part of the Drakeit Pipeline Awareness kind of crew, and he's going to let us know what's been going on in Drakeit. Thanks a lot, and thank you for uh, Kayla and everybody else in Pelham for putting this together. It's, you know, actions like this and events like this organized in probably about 45 to 50 towns already. That's what's making it difficult for Kinder Morgan to put in their pipeline. It's, you know, just having one town as opposed as this town is, frankly, is not going to stop it. It's actually having every single town have something similar and um, for, for towns to work together and coordinate a little bit on strategy and, uh, and tactics and, and talk about what, it, what does it take to actually stop a line. The, the uh, one thing I want to bring up before I go into the tactics is that today, we just got emails from our group, Kinder Morgan is on uh, Blueberry Hill Road and they're on uh, Heather Road today uh, in the middle of the street, like with cameras and you know, survey equipment trying to take pictures of where the compressor station would be. All the neighbors don't want it, so they're all refusing access to it. So there's a pitched battle going on uh, where these people are, co you know, going onto people's property uh, when they're not home, you know, you know, staking out and trying to say, okay, they, they left the house, now let's go in and snap some pictures. So uh, putting the trespassing signs in and get, getting your town to maybe even deny access uh, to certain streets might be helpful if those streets are, if they're going to try to do guerrilla operations and 
guerrilla survey operations that, that it's not with it's not with, uh, beyond their capabilities to try to do that um, as far as the uh, our, our own our Drake gets a little little operation there's actually a, a New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission that's weighing in on the gas contracts there was an article in the Lowell Sun about the gas contracts over the weekend and uh, there it's all public information there's a docket number at the Public Utilities Commission if you have a pen it's 14 dash 380 and the interesting thing about that is that um, if the Liberty Utilities can't justify the need for the gas then the Public Utilities Commission would would have the right to say no we're not going to prove the contract and Ken Morgan's pretty pretty uh, thin in terms of the number of commitments they have for the pipeline so if they get New Hampshire people New Hampshire's Utility Commission to refuse that contract and the same process repeats itself maybe in Maine where there's this currently a proceeding going on about where to get gas and the same thing goes on in Connecticut and, and in Massachusetts with National Grid and with NSTAR then it may be uh, more difficult for Kinder Morgan to to uh, get the contracts that they need to justify the corporate decision the investment decision to build a pipeline so what we're talking about is is there a possible way to bypass I mean forget about FERC if all of the states take action to say well this particular pipeline is so egregious in the way it's going through areas that you know, require so much eminent domain taking that we can not have these contracts agreed to it might help so what Drake did is uh, our group um, got a majority of the board of selectmen to, to oppose the pipeline that was step one once once that happened then we asked them to take additional steps uh, we asked them to intervene in the New Hampshire docket even though we're not in New Hampshire we're across the border uh, and uh, we filed a motion the town sent an attorney up to Concord for one morning unfortunately the people in New Hampshire didn't want to have any part of Drake it telling them what to do or New Massachusetts telling them what to do Drake it was not allowed to intervene in the docket but then we're looking at this proposal and it's talking about Pelham it's talking about Drake it's talking about the Concord lateral which starts in Drake it near the neighborhood where all of the pipeline opponents in Drake live actually I mean, not all of them but the ones that are more most active and uh, we we uh, we asked the selectmen to take a look at this and say hey you know they're blacking out most of the information on what the other companies proposals would do and how they would bring gas in to New Hampshire without having to build a 36 inch line across the state terminating it at the, the Drake location where the Maritimes pipeline starts and obviously the Maritimes pipeline can send that gas off to exporters in, in Canada so um, we, we uh, just wrote a one paragraph letter the Board of Selectmen chair signed it and uh, she got a reply back in about a week and a half saying uh, that the Public Utility Commission had reviewed this and, and was now asking Liberty Utilities to release the information that had previously blacked out and I got an email on Friday saying that they had done that so now we know a little bit more about this Concord lateral and what could be done and it's possible although we don't know the details yet it's possible that a small amount of compression on an existing lateral could supply at least the southern half of New Hampshire west of like Salem uh, that's the part where we're talking about where this pipeline might de deposit a small amount of gas uh, it might be possible to get gas to that area of New Hampshire if it's needed that way so the moral of this is that where, whatever happens uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that there may be people in other parts of the state that feel that there's going to be enough demand for gas in the state that whatever the capacity is now which might be 280 million cubic feet New Hampshire may in, in five or ten years need to have 300 million or 310 or 320 or something like that that's not you know an increase in 20 or 30 million cubic feet is certainly not a good justification to build a pipeline that's going to add over 2,000 million cubic feet or uh, that's but that's what Kinder Morgan wants to do so just making people aware of the fact that this is a ridiculously large and uh, intrusive proposal for the amount of gas co coming in um, that strategy is something that we could all pursue and in particular how many people here from, from Hudson can you raise your hand there were a couple but they left I know I remember three or four of them so the people from Hudson or people that you know in Hudson those folks are customers of Liberty Utilities as a customer you have the right to actually intervene and send letters in this proceeding 
And you know, whereas Pelham people will be listened to more than Drake people, Hudson people will be listened to more than Pelham people because they are customers of liberty. Customers have a legal standing in these proceedings. So just want to throw that out there. People want more details on how to intervene or what letters need to go in or what, what, what questions could be asked. Uh, then they can, they can see me, go through, Caleb knows how to get in touch with me. And uh, uh, you're welcome to come to our Drake meetings as well. We'll, we'll post some of them on the, uh, on the Facebook group. And if there's an email list to set up too, um, you, can, you can all do that. So that's, that's all I wanted to, to, to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to point out one other thing. I, I keep thinking of things. I was kind of nervous when I was talking before, so I'm thinking of things like after the fact to mention too. Um, so Pelham is zoned for one acre lots, and this is what I was trying to question the Kinder Morgan folks about. We, we've had those Concord lateral lines in town for a really long time. They said 60 years. I, I've known about them for at least 15 years. Um, but we, in all that time, and like Drake, it has natural gas. Hudson has natural gas. Pelham still does not have natural gas. The, the likelihood of us getting distribution to our actual houses is like nil. You know, I just don't think it's ever going to happen. We could potentially get it for um, the business district, right, on 38, potentially. But if we needed to have any natural gas for the business district, we could tap in. The, the Concord Lateral runs right there behind Gene Guys. So we could tap in potentially somewhere right there on that. And we don't need this brand new, a third pipeline coming through Pelham who does not have natural gas for home heating. It just is not something that is needed here. And I just wanted to stress that, I guess. And I don't know if anyone has any questions yet. So not so much a question, but a comment. And you know, there's, there's obviously a financial aspect to this. Kinder Morgan is in this to make money. But I can't understate or overstate the, the time aspect. You know, everything that can be done to slow down the process gives more time for alternative pipeline solutions, for alternative solutions to be able to happen. So at the end of the day, you may think there's no way that a couple hundred people in a small town in New Hampshire can beat a very well-funded corporate out-of-state corporation. But again, all you have to do is stick together delay, 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 and it's not just Pelham, as it was said before, it's Pelham, it's Hudson, it's Litchfield, and, and so forth. So just fighting a war of attrition, drawing out the schedule, giving alternative pipeline solutions and other companies an opportunity to propose alternative solutions can be the, uh, can be the path to victory. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, come up. Anyone who has a question, I'm, I'm not, I'm, like, if you have a question, just come right up and talk into the microphone. You can, you can kind of line up, start a little queue if you want. <laughs> this is my first meeting I've ever hosted, so I don't, you know, I'm not as good as it. Okay, thank you, Mr. McGavick. I'm um, I don't know, can you hear that? That's better. Um, I'm on a out of Drake it. One of the things that we were talking about earlier, and she asked me to mention to you, is that when these people, are putting in these pipes. They talk about the inside diameter of the pipe so that you know how much is flowing, how much gas is flowing through. <clears throat> they don't tell you what the outside diameter is. The pipe has to be a certain thickness for certain pressures that are put onto that pipe. So when they say that they're going to push so much through, they have to push, push it through with so much pressure while they need a bigger pipe. Now, as these pipes get bigger, whatever they're using to make the outside walls gets heavier and heavier and heavier. These pipes are going to be shipped in pieces on flatbeds probably, and they're coming down your roads. Your roads are not made for the loads that these are coming down. One piece of pipe may be a ton, they got four or five on a, on a load. Who knows how many? Yeah, I heard they were 40 feet in length, each piece of pipe, when they're shipping in, too. Oh, I have no idea, but so whatever. We can, we can tack that onto our list of unaccounted for costs that are, you know, part of this kind of a project of this scale. Right, and then the other thing that I just thought of when you were talking about the pipelines, I've talked to the, um, uh, oh, what is it? It's my electric company. Engrad or something, what is it? National Grid, yeah, thanks. <laughs> the National Grid, I was talking to the National Grid people, they do have a project that is coming down. They're going to make larger 
uh, transmissions of electricity down their poles. Now, when they, hit, when they transmit the electricity down the pole, they, it interferes, it can interfere with the gas that's going through a pipe. So there has to be uh, a test done on elect or a study, an anal analysis of electromagnetic interference. And the gas that's coming down through those pipes can be explosive. So how do we know what's going on with that? That hasn't been talked about much. I'm trying to learn more about it because I've been involved with listening to stuff on that. So these are two things that we can get some information on and write about. Human life is a problem, and we have what we call a burn zone, which was the people with the, at the um, townhouse section there were talking about, we're going to be gone. That's called the burn zone. If, if the pipe gets a leak in it, boom. That there's certain area, number of uh, feet, yards, um, that will be just, there's no way they can get out of there once that thing starts. So look into all of those things and write about them, okay? Thank you. Thanks for coming up from Drake too. How you doing, my name's John Records. I actually live on Tina Ave in Pelham, and I was just looking at the map over there, and it looks like I'm bumming. Uh, they have the, everything set up right on my yard, my back driveway, and, um, and she was talking about, it was actually the static, because I'm also a licensed gas fitter in the state, state of New Hampshire, and as the, anything passes through the inside of a pipe, it creates a static, and then that can discharge, and that's probably what they're talking about. I'm not sure, I don't know. Uh, the other thing is, uh, where I am, um, if they're coming over, that means my whole house is gone, I just renovated it, you know, do I want to do anything else to the house, or am I just going to wait for them to decide they're just taking the whole thing? Uh, and then the other thing is we have the right next to us, I don't forget what the brook's called, but it sits down there, so obviously they're going to go right through that, and that'll probably block up everything. Um, and then the other thing is we have a big natural aquifer in Pelham, and that's what we're on. And I have, I can literally open my well, it's 225 feet down, but I can see the water at 35 feet. So it's coming, it's right there. So if they contaminate that, that's pretty much probably, I don't know how big the aquifer is, but it's gonna be a lot of the town. And then that's just gonna go underground to everyone else. Uh, and I'm in the P and I. Yeah, me too. So I'm incinerated, my three kids, my wife, the whole neighborhood. Uh, and I have right now, I'm on the power lines, and I have my pine trees that are tall, so I don't see them. But I have a bench in the backyard, a little cul-de-sac, and it shows that construction with the blue lines and everything. They'll probably be sitting on my back bench in my yard, watching me leave for work every day. Yeah. So, I mean, it's something to obviously look into more, and then, so we got the papers, we just pass those in so yeah, they can't so go, so do I want to put signs what is it every 10 feet 15 feet all along my property line yeah i think we have on um i don't know if we did actually but um i can i can look up the information and post that to the facebook page about how specifically to post no trespassing signs and what the rules are for doing that okay and then also on rita ave and tina ave i don't know if anyone knows this but there is no trucks allowed on those two roads it's in the board, they should know about it or whatever, but there is no trucking. That's why everyone has to go around now the other way. I don't know if you know down there, there's like the pit and all that stuff. Yeah, there's I another drove, house yeah, down I drove there yesterday. beyond me. But if they're saying it's on my side of the power lines, I mean, the power lines aren't very far from my house already. So if they're saying 400 feet, that's probably right in the middle of my house. Yeah. And the one thing I want to point out about that, so I've been, I've been going to meetings at other towns. I went to Greenville meeting. I went to meetings in other towns. I went to um, the state Senate briefing with the, I forget exactly what, what was that called specifically? The state Senate thing. It's the Senate Committee on Energy. On Energy, yeah. Um, I went to that and there was a lot of questions raised by the state senators about eminent domain. And what kind of came out of that was that Kinder Morgan will not take your house by eminent domain but they're talking about your physical structure. It is not their intent to take 
a physical house. Now there's a bill that's going around, and someone came up to me tonight talking about that, and I don't know if he's still here. There's a bill that's going around the house right now um, about having, in New Hampshire, if, they, if someone wants to take a part of your property by eminent domain, that they have to be able to take the whole thing. And it's not passed yet, but that's going around too. So right now, Kinder Morgan's talking about only securing an easement. And I don't know if it's at fair market value. I don't know, no, it's probably not at fair market value. I think it goes by the um, amount of pipe, not even for the whole, whole easement, but the amount of pipe that's going through your yard. And um, the other thing about the money that they're talking about promising the towns is based on the capacity running through the pipe. And so they're saying $600,000 to Pelham or whatever. That money has to be offset against what the woman from Drake brought up about our roads being damaged and all the other un unintended costs of this kind of a project. You know, it has to be offset against that. And then pipes depreciate really rapidly over time. So after the first year, that number drops and then it drops again and then it drops again. So we're not going to be seeing a very giant tax coming to the town because of this project in the long term. And then also, people are going to leave. I'm leaving. If, <laughs> I mean, I got no choice now. I'm in the yeah. incineration zone. And I went to high school with your wife, so I mean, it's, she's been in Pelham a long time too. That's unfortunate that and people. And you know, who what do I do? Do here. I build a giant wall next to my house along the whole thing just to so I don't die with my kids? You know, that's the, that's the biggest thing. Is one, everything in the town. As soon as they put it in, the price went down. Everybody's house. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live. Your price is going to go down because no one's going to want to live here with a giant pipeline going through. I mean, that's the thing, it's not just me. Yeah, they could buy my house, I can move somewhere else, but who else is gonna wanna move here once they know this big pipeline's in and the property value is just gonna go down. So they say they're gonna give, I think it was $11 million or something I read, they're gonna give the state of New Hampshire. But if you pick up all those houses and how much you're gonna lose, people are gonna leave and your house property values are gonna go down, it's gonna be a lot more than $11 million and I don't think it's worth it. I'd rather pay more for electricity. I'm not going to blow up. So, I would that's too. all. Thank you. I would too. Good evening. Some of you may have seen me uh, here Thursday. The last time I read the Constitution of the United States, it started with the words, we the people. I don't think I ever read it as saying, we the corporations. There are three words that I have not heard here tonight or the other night. They are Democrat, Republican, or Independent. Now, in Concord, there are a bunch of people who supposedly represent Pelham. I think one of them is a Democrat and the rest of them are Republicans. Suppose that they hear from their voters, look, I don't want this deleted pipeline. If you do not pass a resolution in the state legislature saying no pipeline, I will never vote for you again, and I have a very long memory. That's one thing I think about. Now this morning in Boston, they opened an institute for the United States Senate, named after Mr. Kennedy, okay? Wait a minute, we have a Democratic senator from New Hampshire? We have a Republican senator from New Hampshire. Do they want to be reelected? Do they need to pay attention to the people who live in the state of New Hampshire? Live free or what is it? Oh yeah, get in the incineration zone. <laughs> if our senators and our two representatives hear from the people of New Hampshire, we don't want this deleted pipeline, they might just say, wait a minute, Hello there, independent federal agency that okays pipelines. The folks in Pelham don't want this thing. Um, you're looking for a budget to run next year. And guess who has to okay that budget? The Congress. Two senators, two representatives. Whole batch of people in Concord, New Hampshire. Let them know. You are voters. You have a right to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. I was talking about volunteering and stuff, and one of the other things that I've heard a couple of the towns doing is letter writing campaigns, and or even just getting together at the library or something and, and writing letters. So, and, and you know, I think it's important that we kind of escalate this up to the people who can make decisions and you know speak on our behalf that hold a little bit more clout and weight. You know, state state reps, state senators. 
Board of Selectmen, because if the Board of Selectmen shoot it up the, up the you know, ladder, it will get to the top quicker, and that is going to be, um, I think, pretty pivotal. Hi, Lorraine. <laughs> Thank you for all the work you've done. It's a lot. I just wanted to um, mention that a woman approached me in the audience tonight um, with regard to um, getting a, a flyer out so that people understand what the issues are in town. I think a lot of the problem is that people um, just have not been aware of this pipeline project. Um, unless you are a reader of social media or if you happen to know somebody who is on Facebook, I'm, I'm not on Facebook, um, a lot of the homes that are affected by this um, are older homes, not all of them. There's certainly a beautiful new um, neighborhood around the corner from me and a lot of the people are young people there. But if you're looking at people um, who don't go on social media and uh, perhaps don't even look at the Pelham message board or the Pelham uh, website, I mean, I have a friend that just got um, a computer a couple of years ago. Before that, she didn't uh, have all the access that she has now. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in finding out about is um, I know that we took up a collection tonight, and one of the one of the very generous women in the audience told me that she'd be willing to give uh, money towards a, a flyer. I think the way to reach people is to send out a flyer. I know a few years ago, um, people told me that it was over three hundred dollars to do a nonprofit through the post office, but it reached all of the homes in town. So this might be a really good idea because sometimes if you get a flyer in a newspaper or so, if you're not a fan of the newspaper, it may go in the trash. But if you have something directly um, mailed to you, uh, perhaps with a little catchphrase on it um, regarding the pipeline and how it will affect you, um, people pay attention to it. They may be more willing to open it up and see, well, gee, how is this going to affect me or my neighbors or my children? Um, and the other thing that Mr. McLaughlin pointed out with regard to um, calling our congressman, this, uh, today I called um, Senator Shaheen, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Custer, um, the governor's office, um, one lovely gentleman at the Department of Environmental Services referred me um, to another department, and he was an absolute gentleman on the phone. Um, if you want to call up there, um, I'd be happy. I, I can't re remember his name at the moment, but if you want to call me, Lorraine Doobie, 635-7187. My number is in the phone book, not in the Yellow Pages book that they keep sending us, but uh, you can find my number. Um, <laughs> I'd be happy to talk with anybody, and I'd be happy to talk with anyone. If we didn't get enough money tonight from the, the um, fundraiser uh, to go towards a flyer, uh, if people want to call me, I'd be very happy to get together and, and try to get the word out to people. When I first heard about this, I looked at the um, incineration zone on the map that Donna here was very nice to put on some social media. And I actually started looking at the roads and went to the assessor sites to see if I could get people's phone numbers. And the peculiar thing that has happened over the years is um, you can't always get people's phone numbers because a lot of people have dropped their landlines and they've got cell phones now or some people just use the internet for everything. So um, I did have some phone books at home from over the years. Um, and so I did look up a lot of people. And every single person that I called knew nothing about the pipe. Line. And that's perhaps why we don't have such a large audience here tonight. People just aren't aware. They don't know that this is a threat to them and to their, their home and home life and their, their way of life and, and to, to their health and well-being and that of their families. So I think the way that we can beat this is to make sure that all of our state reps are behind us, all of our state senators, all of our U.S. senators, and all of our U.S. Congress people. And that way, if we get together and, and let them know we oppose this, as well as all the other towns that are affected by this, I think we'll have a great voice to defeat it. My name's uh, David Silva. I live on Sherburn Road. Um, I'm so far removed from the pipeline, I am three-tenths of a mile from Tingsboro. I'm, so I'm far away from it. I attended a meeting last Thursday, and um, I, if I, I came in here with an open mind, sort of, that okay, if there's, 
after listening to these gentlemen the other night, there's no way that I would support this. There's, there, I, I don't believe this is going to, it's not going to benefit Pelham at all. I believe it's minimally going to benefit New Hampshire. When they were saying that they didn't have any customers yet, they, they think they might want to do a 30-inch pipe or it would be a 36-inch pipe. I'm telling you right now, if they're going to put a pipe in there, it's going to be a 36. They're not going to put a 30 in there and then five years later said, oh, geez, we should have put a 36. So right then and there, it tells me that, I, that the project is, they're being disingenuous. Um, the other thing is about it, it, it takes the town and it bisects it. It's already bisected, but this, with increased uh, the power wires and then the increased piping, it just takes the whole town and just cuts it right in half. Um, as far as tactics, I'm going to do, I'm going to be really brief. Uh, has anybody ever heard of the uh, uh, Mills uh, Mall in Tuxbury, Massachusetts? Okay, because we fought it in that town. It was supposed to be a mega mall. And the only reason I'm telling you this is because we know the tactics that when people have money and they want to make money, the tactics they use to get there. They approach the, our politicians, they get the key politicians on board, they get key people in town, and then they go after it. And the other night I was here and I saw the union people here. We have taste of union people. When we had our meetings and we were fighting a mega mall in Tuxbury, Massachusetts, they intimidated us, they threatened us, they called us names, they, they blocked our way when we were trying to come to public meetings. Ultimately, we did, when people talk about facts, we, we, we traveled around the country. They have the uh, mills, the London malls down in Baltimore, they've got them all over the country. We and actually went out and took trips, and we found out that this particular mills mall was financially unsound. We fought and fought and fought, and we kept trying to tell the town leaders, you're going to take our town and you're going to do something that's going to ruin it forever. Um, I voted against that project in May of 2004, the same month that I moved to Pelham. It's the last thing I did in Tuxbury, I voted against the mall and then I moved to Pelham. We lost the, we lost the battle because it was approved. But ultimately, we won the war because our facts stood up that that company was not financially viable, there was corruption, there was greed, and they failed. Is anybody here of Xanadu in Meadowlands? It's a big mall. They, put, they call it Xanadu. Mills Properties had it. The place is a ghost town. But I'm just what I'm telling you this is not because this is not the same concept, but I know the tactics that they'll do. The gentleman here with the signs the saying, you know, our jobs are on this line, I wanted to tell them, you know what, our lives are on this line. And that's what we should say, this, this line, our lives are on this line. Because their jobs will be gone. And they're going to move off to someplace else and they're going to do some other tactics elsewhere. Um, so I'm very familiar with, uh, with uh, flyers. We actually hired an ad agency to do a glossy flyers for us. We made our own flyers, we mailed them, we meet at people's houses. Um, we stood outside with signs. We had, we gave our name, you know, you have a name, we gave our aso association a name and we sat out on the streets on Sunday mornings, Saturday mornings, and did all we could. And ultimately, the bottom line is we won it, but it was a very, 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 very tough battle. And money is, uh, does speak pretty loud. So I just want to give you my opinion and I'm more than willing to help, so. Do you have the, do you have the lawn sign on Chairman Road now? Uh, what's that? The lawn sign on Sherburn Road? No, not yet. I signed up for one tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah, I live on Sherburn Road. If nobody knows where it is. Way across town everybody from where they're proposing. Where it yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, I figured that much. <laughs> it's East West Highway. Yeah. <laughs> Very high visibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, this is David Maloney. He's from um, Hollis, New Hampshire. Hi, I'm New Hampshire. I started um, New Hampshire Pipeline Awareness, a co-founder with some other people. And we're trying to do a statewide movement. So um, all the all 17 towns, um, well, it's actually 19 if you really think about it, but 17 towns, uh, we're trying to get involved and take this to the state level. So we'd love to have people from Pelham uh, help us, and uh, Kayla is our one of our contact people in 
Pelham. So if you can coordinate with her to get more involved, we would love to have your active involvement. Um, we're just getting off the ground as far as a statewide movement because we were originally this pipe, I mean, this is all brand new, right? December 8th is when they filed to say that the, the line was gonna be changed to New Hampshire. So that's given us three months to get ourselves organized. But I as found a out about statewide. it in January, so. Three months time. is not a lot of time. And, uh, and we don't have the luxury of time either, so we are frantically moving in a, in a very fast direction. Um, so we'd love to have more people involved. We don't have a lot of activities for everybody to get involved in yet, but we do have a lot planned, and we do want to get people involved. And one thing you can do right away is just sign that petition, because uh, right now our goal is to get to Governor Hassan's office. We want to be in her office and to, talk, to knock some sense into her because, uh, you know, politically what's going on at the State House is that the Democratic Party has um, abandoned you as far as your pipeline is concerned. And Governor Hassan has a lot to do with that. So um, that's not exactly the kind of coalition we need to build statewide. We need um, more people involved. We need representatives to hear from you and the trickle-up effect is, gonna, is what's going to change things. Um, so please get involved. Uh, I'm really encouraged by what I'm hearing in Pelham because um, I've been to a lot of these meetings. Uh, they had one in, in Hollis, New Hampshire. Uh, by the way, the reason we started this group was because originally the pipeline was coming through Hollis, New Hampshire, and nowhere else in New Hampshire. Now it's not going through Hollis, but it's going through just about everywhere else in southern New Hampshire. Uh, that's not my fault. <laughs> uh, don't blame me, but um, uh, I wish it was my fault. I wish I was, you know, strong enough to make such things happen. But uh, this is not a NIMBY issue for me. I'll just let you know. It never went by my house. It never went near my property. But I feel for my community, I feel for all communities that are having to deal with this. And one of the things I'm really encouraged by hearing all of you is that in Pelham, I'm hearing really good questions. Somebody said the devil's in the details. That is absolutely the case. We need to nickel and dime these people to death. That's what you need to do at a local level, okay? There are so many things that are not being examined and so many people have brought up very specific things that need to be examined. I heard someone say, uh, list off some of Kinder Morgan's um, failures. Failure to measure pipeline corrosion levels. Well, isn't that interesting? Because we have this problem of inductance that happens between pipelines and power lines, and the factors that go into that, just not to bore you to death, but there's many, the soil, what kind of soil is it? How compact is it? How much moisture does it have? What is, its geog what is the geometry of the pipe in relation to the power line? How many phases are there in the power line? All of these things are factors. They're f and uh, is Kinder Morgan measuring all of these things? We don't know, right? Uh, what happens if you do get this, I mean, this inductance issue, okay, they're gonna try to, site a pipe that's far enough away that induction be doesn't become a problem. Does it mean that a closed loop between that pipe and that power line can never happen? Absolutely not. And if it should happen, and let's just say there was a quality control issue on that pipeline where what's called a coating holiday, okay, they have a coating layer that goes around the inner pipe. The inner pipe needs to be protected at all times. That cannot corrode. If it corrodes, then you have what's called the incineration zone. I like to call it an incineration radius. It's not a zone. It's not a diameter. It's a radius from the pipe. And in this particular case, it extends over three football fields. That's not the point. The point is that if there's a coating holiday in the pipe that's one inch thick, a V-shaped coating holiday, meaning there's a chip in the outer coating of that thing, and you happen to have inductance at that location, just, just a completely hypothetical situation where you would have inductance which created a closed loop between the pipeline and the power line, it will take 
um, according to one calculation I saw, and this would be based on what size the pipe was, chances are in this area, I don't know if you're in the, in the uh, low impact area in Pelham, maybe not. It's been back and forth. You might be low impact, you might be high impact, and I'm not, so I'm not really sure how long it would take for the pipe to corrode. But that corrosion is fast. 17 hours was what I read in a document. Okay, so will any of these things happen? Probably not. Am I creating hysteria? Probably, yes. Yes, this is not something you probably have to worry about. But when you start to nickel and dime and look at every single consequence of this project, and the things that are not talked about. Nobody talked about pig valves. Anyone know what a pig valve is? I mean, a pig station? Okay, a pig station is where they clean the pipes. Well, what happens when they clean the pipes and all this ref, you know, uh, refuse, whatever you call it, the garbage comes out of it. Where's that get cleaned up? How well does it get cleaned up? You saw the, you saw the, ex the, uh, the uh, off, um, uh, off moisturization of the of the water after they'd cleaned a pipe after a, um, a segment was hydrostatically pressurized uh, you know these are all details they're all details they're all important and these are the types of things you can fight at a local level that aren't fought as well at the state level right these are people's homes these are your rights as citizens and you need to stick up for those rights so I really encourage you to keep up that good work in Pelham because all the communities have to do that but you know you can start tabulating these things and really starting to delineate what are the real harms here you know there's so many hidden harms that we don't talk about and we need to expose them bring them out in the open so that people can understand them uh, another one that I thought of by the way I've been thinking about this for eight months now since I started <laughs> working into this now nine months now sorry um, the frost line they don't bury the pipe four feet. I always build, build, I mean, I've built things. I've built them four feet at least for their foundation. These pipes are buried three feet. And we know that there are frost heaves throughout New Hampshire. Um, and I was under the impression, because my father-in-law is a civil engineer, and he told me that, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Um, by the way, there's cathodic protections on these um, induction uh, layers so that if you had a cathodic protection meaning that you know uh, electricity was able to run along the outside of the pipe and not cause any corrosion then you wouldn't have a problem but um, you know you have things like that cathodic protection so you know you don't worry about things like uh, electricity and um, for whatever reason he seemed to think because of the crushed uh, gravel that they put around the pipe and all that sort of thing that you know there could never be any kind of um, you know uh, water eruption problem or, or you know, uh, um, a frost heave of some sort, right? But I talked to an engineer all last week who's worked on these pipes, who told me all about the kinds of frost heave protections that are required and that uh, are possible to occur on these lines. So just another, you know, here I was thinking because my father-in-law assured me that uh, it wasn't a problem, that actually uh, it can be a problem. Um, radon 222, somebody mentioned radon. Radon 222 is, comes out of Marsalis shale. The vast majority of the Marsalis shale does have radon in it. Um, if this were to come to your homes, and the homes that it does come to potentially uh, now have a radon problem. And we know we have mitigation for radon all over New Hampshire, but a lot of these uh, places where radon is now entering the home now have a whole new radon problem to deal with, potentially. Um, I think that's it. The, I mean, you're getting, the, you're getting the right idea in terms of there's very little here for you as a community. You're not going to get the gas. Um, you're just to disperse uh, a community, and maybe some parts of your community might get it. But the vast majority of you will not. New Hampshire is getting a raw deal out of this, a really, really raw deal. Um, will it bring down prices? It might for a short period of time. What will happen in the long run? Probably very, very little. So for the promise of a potentially small window of price relief in your electric bill, actually not even in your electric bill, probably more for the people who are signed up for local distribution, which are not you people, uh, there may be some price relief there. 
for the rest of us, this is, uh, this is a project that uh, shows no benefit to us. Again, net exporter of electricity. Um, we may end up paying for it in our electric bills. Uh, and, and the project signs up, by the way, the project, Kinder Morgan project, signs up um, local distribution companies for gas. These are the people who provide home heating fuel and fuel supplies, not electrical supply. There are no gas-fired power plants signed up. There are other projects that do that, or that don't necessarily sign up other projects, um, gas-fired power plants, but for instance, the As As Access Northeast project is set up to uh, have partnerships with electrical distribution companies. And those electrical distribution companies are right along the pipeline. 60% of the electrical distribution of the gas-fired power plants are along the pipeline. If you add the Iroquois pipeline, you're up to 70%. How many are along the NED pipeline? Three, I think, in New Hampshire. And they're not even next to it. They're close. So um, there's a big discrepancy here between, uh, you know, and, and the vast quantities, the 2.2 billion cubic feet, so much more than we will ever need. Liberty, Liberty Utilities is signing up for 5% of this pipeline, 5%. So where's the benefit to New Hampshire? We become Basically, we take all the risk, and we take all the harms, and uh, we get Cost. no benefit. And uh, you know, potentially off this goes to export. Export, as it was defined by some people earlier, is a little more complicated than that. It's not that far off. Japan, by the way, will get, uh, last year was getting $19 a gallon. Uh, somebody mentioned $16 in China. $19 a gallon in Japan, I mean, not a gallon. 1,000 cubic feet, sorry. Um, anyway. I had a concern, too, about export, because um, it, 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 natural gas is already being exported from the country. It's already happening in the Gulf and places like that. Um, and so it, there's a lot of speculation um, if the prices that we have, that we see for natural gas being so low, if they're going to stay and continue to be so low, the more and more the natural gas gets exported. So it's, you know, it doesn't lock us into a... It, we don't, we're not always going to benefit from tiny, tiny low prices of natural gas like we do because it's a domestic energy source if we keep shipping it out and putting it on the global market and stuff. Yeah, just if I can add to that, in terms of supply, there are at least three things that are going to affect supply. One is that um, we talk about something called peak gas. There are a number of uh, frack fields that exist in the United States currently that have already experienced peak gas. That means that they've already reached the point where they're probably never going to replace the amount of gas that they've produced in the past. They're diminishing in return. You only get about three years out of a frack field, so they have to find new places to frack after those three years. And by the way, when they leave the frack fields, they just abandon them, and that's where you get all this fugitive uh, um, methane, which is causing massive problems. Are they just open pools when they abandon them? They don't fill them in or anything? No. What, well, what happens is, what, what the frack field, you have, what happens is you, you frack a field, and some of the water comes back up out of the, actually out of the wellhead and that water has to go into a containing pool. So they create a containing pool for that, and it stays there in perpetuity. So whatever's in that water, the, you know, 600 chemicals in the fracking water, and we have no idea what it is because the Halliburton rule says we can't know. Well, all that's just sitting there in open pits. Um, and you saw that picture that Caleb put up. I mean, you literally have the colonization of a particular region of the, of the United States. It's being colonized. And what do they get out of it? They get, you know, whatever the emissions are from these, you know, the vaporization of these frack fields is just now they're, you know, the pleasure of where they get to live. Um, but most of the water is deep injected into wells, and that's part of the reason why, why the Halliburton uh, uh, rule, um, rule exists. It's because th we're, we're basically they're, they're excavating for a gas which allegedly is below the water line, right? The water table exists at a certain level, and then, you know, gas extraction happens someplace way further deep than that. So the idea is that there's no contamination or there's no contact between these two different um, uh, systems. Well, of course, that's not true. Um, most of it is deep injected, so it goes from that, 
deep location to an even deeper location where it gets stored and then can never be used again because it's fracked, you know, it's um, chemi chemically charged and could never possibly be used again. Not to mention it's below the water table, so you'd never recover it anyway. But, um, and else, by the way, you can, I mean, there's all kinds of, we could talk about fracking all night, but, you know, earthquakes and all the, all the other things that pot potentially happen with frack fields. But you do have that problem of fugitive gas happening there too. So you've got, because there's an inherent problem, by the way, with fracking, and that is that the casings that the well are, is produced from are cement. What happens with cement? It shrinks. Well, if you have a cement well that shrinks, a cement casing that shrinks, you have an inherent problem with uh, a gas, right? Because gas on a shrinking casement is probably going to leak. But then you also have the issue of you're no longer fracking the field, but it's still releasing methane, so you still have the problem of methane. Um, when you add up all of those things, when you add up the frack fields and the gathering lines and the transmission lines and the distribution lines and the uh, compressor stations, you're talking about a lot of fugitive methane. And by the way, in the electric industry, they do not count fugitive methane. When they tell you that gas-fired gas power plants burn at a certain efficiency and create a certain amount of emissions, they're talking about CO2. They're talking about when you burn this, the natural gas, how much CO2 do you get? There's no mention, there's no calculation, there's no factorization of methane, which is 80, potentially 86 times as powerful a greenhouse gas emitter as CO2. So anyway, um, it's not a great, this is, this is not sounding good, and if you think this is good for New Hampshire, you need to reevaluate it, because uh, I was just mentioning, I was trying to get to the three sources of things that uh, could potentially keep the supply from getting to us. One is that, um, that there is this idea of peak gas, and we may not actually get this gas, um, that there is a peak gas condition that does occur, that does exist. Right now our reserve supply um, goes out maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years. We don't really know how large it is, but it's based on a set of reserves that we know that exist. Everybody tells you, I heard someone at the, air, at the uh, Senate meeting last week from the Iroquois pipeline tell us there was a hundred year supply of this stuff. A hundred years is how, much res is how much resource there is available. The, res the reserve that we have is completely different from that. Just like oil, we've only tapped about you know 30%, I think, of all the oil reserves that we have in the world, but we can't get at all the oil. That's the resource. The reserve is what we can get at. Very different topics. And what we're seeing is that some of these gas fields already have hit peak gas and that we're reducing our supply. Marcellus supply is gaining in size, but uh, overall, the expectations, especially on the futures market, is far less um, positive than, than Wall Street will tell you. Um, another is that a lot of, all of these pipelines have to go through New York before they can get to Massachusetts and New England. New York has an insatiable desire for more natural gas. Not so much right now, but over the course of the next five years and beyond that, uh, their, their desire for natural gas is going to increase over time significantly. That could actually cut off the supply that we see in New England altogether. Now, if we have signed contracts with companies in New England, they can't desert those contracts. But after those contracts are up, we could see that there's a diminishment of supply in our region. And then, of course, the last one is exports. So once you get to the export terminals, um, we see that now we're trading on a worldwide market. The worldwide market right now is very diversified. There is, there's not a single, you know, like you think about oil as a worldwide world commodity and you have a fixed, effectively a fixed price for oil. This doesn't exist for LNG, liquid natural gas. Liquid natural gas sells at a certain price in one place and a certain other price in another place and that's because some people have supply and other people have demand and that they haven't caught up to each other on the global market. So you have this disparity that exists. We could actually import, potentially, LNG at a cheaper price and export at a different price, depending upon the kinds of relationships we develop with other countries and what kind of leverage we apply. 
So this could be a totally rigged game where, you know, we're exploiting some country to get imports and, ex, you know, exploiting another country to, to, to uh, get the highest price for exports. But what will happen is over time there'll be some sort of uh, modulation of this. And when that does happen, the overall price of that gas will be much higher than it is now. And so what will happen to the domestic market is the domestic market for gas will then obviously start going up. So the price you pay for gas after it's been exported for a while is going to be significantly pr higher and the price point the demand for that gas is not going to be your demand, it's going to be the world demand. And so you will be in competition with the world demand. Companies like Dow Chemical are all over this, uh, trying to explain to the U.S. government that, uh, you know, their domestic product is going to be devastated by export demand. And, uh, and they have a legitimate case. So. Okay, so I think, I think yeah, thank you. I think the bottom line of what, uh, of what all the statements are is that like we, um, in Pelham, it doesn't pose a benefit, you know, it, it's probably not going to be the best thing for New Hampshire anyway, too. So what can we do locally to fight it? And I, I want to jump on what Mr. Hellesey was saying and start, you know, you know, doing these rallies or doing these, you know, publicity things so that we can get more people in town to care. The gentleman on Sherburn Road, he's across town. He doesn't have any effect by this going through his backyard. How, does, how come he cares, but we don't have, see like a broader group of people in Pelham that's not directly at this caring? How did you find out about this? Uh, I saw it on the news, and I, I went on the internet, and I saw where they were going to do this and that, and our town going home, and uh, I liked it. I know. Just talk into the top of it. We want to get it on. I don't like speaking. Okay, my name's Harriet St. Orange. I live on Mammoth Road. I'm a 73-year-old widow. When I heard about this, the first thing I thought about is, oh my God, they're going to knock down my house. And I told my kids, if a bulldozer comes up, I'm staying in the house, they're going to have to knock it down with me in it. And that's my attitude. They would have to knock the house down with me in it. Now, I think the, the th years and years ago, and I can't remember how many years ago, I was involved in uh, stopping a wood-burning plant in Pelham. I don't know if anybody remembers that. They tried to build a wood-burning plant up in Pelham and Hudson. And a bunch of us got together and we beat out a billion dollar plant, billions of dollars. They wanted to send two, three hundred trucks a day up Mammoth Road with, with knockdown houses. They were going to burn everything toxic. And we fought it and we won. But it wasn't easy because half the town wanted it and half the town didn't. And like the other gentleman said, we were harassed and everything. I think the thing that bothered me tonight when I walked in is, where is Pelham? Where are all the people that live in this town? And I think if the people in this town knew about it, um, this pl you would need the high school. You would need the high school. And I took some petitions. I'm going to go up and down Mammoth Road, and I'm going to see how many signatures I get. I'm going to go to my bank and see if I can pack my butt there for four or five hours and get more signatures. And I did tell one lady, she said that the mass mailing would cost probably $300. And I said, if it's 300 bucks, I'll write the check. I will write a check to help you. Because I don't want my neighbors and my friends who live on the other side of Pelham to have to go through this. I already went through the wood burning plant. I'm 73. I'm sick of people who try to shove gas lines under our town. I just don't want it. I don't want it for you, I don't want it for me, I don't want it for your kids. So if you want 300 bucks for mailing, ask me, you got it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I talked about uh, the other thing that we were collecting. So we'll, we'll collect all those petitions. And then the other thing we were, were collecting were the um, deny access forms or rescind access forms for survey. We'll, I'll, I'll personally um, send those out in a big group so we only have to do postage warrants and I'll send it um, certified mail and everything. So if you have those written or filled out, you can just keep those here and hand them to me and I'll take care of that for you. And let's all be in touch on Facebook and email and stuff so we can start planning how to get more awareness in town and 
try to stop this together, I guess. Thanks for coming tonight, everyone. I'll take those. <laughs>